puppy <laughs> is going to reverse park. I think it's called, no, not parallel parking. No, I can do that. Parallel parking I can do. Okay. But also so, bear in mind that Tam taught me how to drive, so. We're going to park down. Oh my god. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> 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 the slight problem is the sun. So this week will be a two episode week because last week Fluffy's PC decided to be a diva. Okay, did we even tell them where we are? No, we didn't. We didn't. We are in the parking lot next to the old Cape Town Zoo. Yes. Which is located on... I don't think it's the same land, but it's right next to UCT. Speaking of hells and devils, please tell me about an unsolved murder mystery that you have found. A South African unsolved murder mystery. Uh, this is by, I think there's this book that's called Famous South African Crimes uh -huh. by a Mr. Rob Marsh. So shout out to you. But today we're yes. talking about... The mystifying death of Bubbles Schroeder. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bubbles. Tell me about Bubbles. Uh, did she have sisters named Blossom and Buttercup? She did not. Uh, <laughs> Her yes. name Bubbles. was... Um, forgive me for the mispronunciations, but they're gonna happen. Uh -huh. Alright, here we go. Uh, so, she was called... Jakuba Bubbles Schroeder mm -hmm. and she was born in Lichtenberg on 8th of June 1931. So it was said that Bubbles was a nice girl, she was very pretty, uh -huh. but she was what you would call like a good time girl, she was like a glamour girl. She was a young woman but a little loose in her morals. So she liked She to was have, sexually progressive. She liked to have a good time. Okay. So the writer Rob Marsh said that people are so fascinated with her because she kind of the epitome of the post war mentality where, you know, after the war, like during the war people are very conservative yes. and there's restrictions mm -hmm. and rations and mm -hmm. things like that. And then after the war, mainly in America, not so much everybody else. This is the First World War before we're getting into the Second World War. It was very much about, you know, having a good time. You know, it's that pendulum swing of being very conservative and mm -hmm. then it will swing the other way. So kind of she like was the like, light that we have. Exactly. <laughs> like it's like just that light. That's that's the pendulum. <laughs> so this is conservatism and then that's where bubbles were. She sort of represented like the epitome of that time of you know c coming out of the war and just wanting yeah. to have a good time yeah. and women being a little bit more liberated than they were pre-war i mean not as liberated as they are now we still have work to do don't get too ahead of yourself but at that time you know they would have hmm. been a bit more because they took up more responsibilities within society because yes. there was no men around yes so she liked to have a good time she was very sweet, but apparently when she got a bit too much in her, she got very drunk and she got very belligerent. So she got very argumentative and she was very hard to manage. She became unmanageable. Basically, Why are you trying to manage a girl? I don't know. <laughs> Please continue. It's 19, <laughs> like, you know, June 1949. Like, if her party goblin comes out, like, there ain't nothing you can do about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> party goblin! <laughs> On the night that she died, so she was living in a an apartment with a girlfriend mm. called Mrs. Griffin, who was a hostess. So it sounded like maybe it was one of those boarding houses. Oh. And she would basically, like, date guys. Because it said that she didn't really have a job, but she always had money. So it seems like she was just, you know, having so a good time. So she had some sugar daddies. She was having a good time, uh, you know, living off of her wits and her looks and all that stuff. And she would basically, like, go on dates with everything that that would entail. <laughs> uh, Dinner, dancing, home by 10. Done. Or well, maybe the next morning. Who knows? 
I didn't say 10 p.m. <laughs> a.m. <laughs> she was in, initially living with a man called Stain, Philip Stain, and then she got drunk too, went, went too many times, and then he told her to move out, and that's when she moved in with Mrs. Griffin. Okay. Okay. And then she made a date with this guy called Morris Bilchick. The On Thursday the 11th, they made a date for that following Saturday night. Right. So they went back to his apartment and then spent the night together. Mm -hmm. Then on the following Monday, Mr. Bilchick was boasting to his friend, Mr. Pol Poliak, P-O-L-L-I-A-C-K. Pollock? Pollock, Poliak. Let's call him Pollock. Then at lunchtime, the two men visited Bubbles. And the plan was is that Bubbles was supposed to get hold of one of her girlfriends so that they could do a double dip. Penny was nowhere to be found. Right. And in the end, they simply decided to make a threesome. But not have a threesome, oh. just be a threesome. <laughs> You're nasty. Forgive me. <laughs> I got excited when you said girlfriend. I was like, oh, 1930s progressive lesbian, lesbian literature. Let's go. Nope. And then I got excited for threesome. No. Okay. <laughs> Girl, you met. <laughs> so after Bill Chick and Pollock had left, she went mm. to visit Philip Stain at his apartment that afternoon and then had a few glasses of brandy and then returned home at six. When she reached her home, Dorchester Mansions, Bill Chick and Pollock were already waiting for her and then she apologized for keeping them waiting. And they went inside for her to change. And then around 7, they set out for Mr. Pollock's house. Pollock's mother was in Durban at the time. So the three of them virtually had this house to themselves. When they arrived, Pollock's cousin, Mr. Hyman Balfour Liebman, okay, 20 at the time, was leaving for Houghton to pick up his girlfriend. Right. So he wasn't joining the party? No, he was just leaving the house. Okay. So he, so he was can obviously confirm staying that they were all going to the house. Okay. Going to the house. Pollock and Bilchik invited him to bring his... Invited. Invited him. <laughs> invited yeah. him. To bring his girlfriend, yeah. <laughs> to bring his Macy. They invited him to bring his girlfriend back to the house so they could all like party together. Okay. But he declined because they had already planned to go out to the movies that night. So. And this was before cell phones and you couldn't exactly just text a girl. So then Liebman drove off to have a night out with his girlfriend. Oh, okay. Bubbles drank a few glasses of brandy and mm -hmm. snacked on a tin of peanuts. So then 11.15, Bill Tech left the home because it seemed obvious that Bubbles and Pollock were vibing and that they wanted yeah, to wanna be, be left alone. Third wheel. Oh, I know those feelings, bro. So Bill Tech had left Bubbles and then Bubbles and Pollock cleared up the living room and then they went upstairs to listen to records in Pollock's bedroom. And then not long afterwards, Bill Tech phoned. It seemed he was a bit jealous and he first spoke to Bubbles and then apologized to Pollock for disturbing them. And then after 15 minutes or so, I think it says rang, he rang off, which I think means he, you know, ended the call. After midnight, Pollock's cousin returned, Mr. Liebman returned from his son of a date. And Pollock met him in the hallway and told him that Bubbles was in his room. And the trouble was that she'd had too much to drink and he wanted to get her home before she passed out. Right. As you know, before then, she was a lovely, sweet girl. Uh -huh. But when she had a bit too much to drink, she became unmanageable. This is a very important point. I mean, some people just can't handle their drink. And if she was fairly small, like it wouldn't take, and she was drinking like brandy and not. Pro brandy makes people violent. Would she be drinking brandy coke? Probably. That's probably really, really old <laughs> South African drink. <laughs> I don't know. No, I think back then people didn't really mix soda with because um, the only liquid, the only liquid, the only spirit that you're actually supposed to mix with something is gin. So if she was drinking brandy in the 30s, she was more than likely probably drinking like brandy. Or on meat. the rocks. On the rocks. Same with whiskey, same with vodka. So, where are we? So, Libman went upstairs to see for himself, and then it was clear that Bubbles had a bit too much to drink. Right. So, now they were going to take her home. But she wanted to have another drink, so Mr. Libman gave her a weak brandy. Then, at about uh, half past 12 in the morning, Bubbles wanted to go home. She said her mother was staying with her and was expecting her at one o'clock so this is half past 12 she's supposed to be home at one but also she's been drinking the entire day whole day she's whole been day. drinking from lunchtime mm -hmm. 
all the way through mm -hmm. to half past 12. That we know of. And so then eventually at half past one, so she's already late for curfew. She's already late. Half past one, they go into the driveway to try and get her in the car to get home. Yes. But now, instead of getting into Mr. Pollock's car, she gets into Mr. Lidman's car. But because she's unmanageable and yeah. she's drunk, she refuses to get out. So then after a while trying to convince her to get out, Lidman is like, you know what? I will just drive her home. Okay. But then he comes back about 15, 20 minutes later, which is obviously a bit too short for yeah. how long the journey is. And he uh, comes back alone. So then Pollock's like, basically like, dude, what the fuck? What happened? And Liebman says, oh no, she basically got like belligerent because she wanted to drive and he wouldn't let her. So he was actually, he was being responsible because she is, let's do it together because she was unmanageable. She kept insisting that she had to drive. So what did, did he just kick her out the car? So then it sounds like, uh, he goes, that girl's a lunatic. She wanted to drive and when I wouldn't let her, she made me stop and got out. I told her to be sensible, but she wouldn't listen. He said that he tried to get her to come back in the car, but she was being belligerent and unmanageable. Probably didn't wouldn't try get that back hard. in. Probably didn't try that hard. You didn't have any connection to this girl. And then he was like, well, it's so early in the morning. She's probably fine. Right. Sorry. Sorry. This is South Africa in the 1930s. Right. Okay. Fine. Half past one in the morning, she's fine. At, she's okay. probably fine. Right. Yeah. At that time of night, I didn't think she'd come to any harm. Quote, unquote, Mr. Liebman. He was tired and he went to bed. And then Mr. Pollock was worried about her. So then it was nearly 2 a.m. So they left at around half past one. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think he came back after about 15, 20 minutes. They would have had their little conversation and then Pollock would have gotten in the car to go and look for her. Mm. So he set off to town in car to try and find her. And about an hour later, he returned, but Bubbles Schroeder had vanished. Then the two men assumed that Bubbles was able to get a lift from a passing motorist and that nothing was wrong later bill Chick and pollock yeah they called Dorch dorchester mansions where she was staying to see mm. if bubbles was there uh but learned from her mother that she had not returned from the night out and after they heard the news pollock went to see mrs schroeder himself later bill Chick, pollock and mrs schroeder drove down to rosebank police station to report that bubbles was missing okay so pollock also telephoned the general hospital to see if she had been admitted there. So then Bubbles Schroeder's body was discovered 30 hours after her death at Birdhaven Plantation. The plantation was less than a kilometer from the spot where Liebman claimed to have dropped her off. She was lying on her back among burnt out grass about 30 meters from the road. Her face was turned to the right. Her left leg was laid over her right. Her left arm was pressed against her body while her right was flung out at a 70 degree angle. She was hatless, shoeless, and her coat was missing. Although there were scratch marks and some bruising around her neck, there were no footprints around the body, nor any signs of violent struggle. So it's quite clear that somebody had placed her body there. Because yeah. her left leg was over her right leg. Yeah. And she'd been, and with her arm out like that, it's almost as if somebody like dragged her to oh, that spot. No. But this is where it gets kind of interesting. Not that it hasn't been interesting <laughs> until this point. So the first thing that struck Dr. J. Friedman, uh, who was the district surgeon when yeah. he arrived at the scene of the crime, was the position of the body, as yeah. we just said. From the way Bubbles was lying, it appeared that she'd been placed carefully on the ground, which suggested that she'd been murdered nearby and then carried, probably over the shoulder, into the plantation. Mm -hmm. This assumption was substantiated by the fact that although both of the victim's shoes were missing, there was neither grass nor soil on the soles of her feet. She certainly had not walked to the spot where her body was stowed. The bodice of her green dress she wore was slightly ripped and one button was missing. The lower right leg of her stocking was also snagged in a number of places. Her panties were torn on the right side, but her black petticoat and black brassiere were intact. 
The postmortem revealed that she had not been sexually assaulted. Okay. And then in her mouth were some pieces of hard clay-like material. Although none of the bits lay deep in her throat. And there were no particles in her lungs. Proving that this was put into her mouth after she was dead. So she hadn't breathed any of it in. So it wasn't like... Clay into her mouth? Like somebody wasn't trying to smother her with dirt. Like they put it in after she was dead. So Dr. Freeman concluded that the cause of death was asphyxia and in and inhibition due to the pressure on her throat and the impact of a hard clay like sublance substance similar to that in a heap of builder's lime a couple of meters away in her hypopharynx. They estimated the time of death was around two o'clock on the morning of Tuesday. 16th of August. So while Pollock was driving out trying to find her, that's she was when already she dead. Died. So it's like she basically um, died soon after she was let out of the car. Let's jump into. So who did kill Bubble Shrew? Okay, so she was found lying in a field. Mm. Body was positioned. A lot of her clothes were ripped and torn. No sexual assault, mm. but they did find clay, hard clay, lime-like substance in her mouth the first one the police contended that libman himself had strangled her in his car using a scarf she also sorry to jump back quickly she also had a condition Schroeder was suffering from a condition of the thymus gland which would have caused her to fall unconscious very quickly from only slight pressure around the neck so who killed her so it was the first theory was that libman himself strangled her with a scarf in his car when he attempted to make sexual advances on her. When she fell unconscious, he had carried her body away from the road, but there wasn't a shred of evidence. But also, her. if his cousin knew the time that he came home and the, the doctor said that the time of death was two, it kind of, he wouldn't have been with the body to have killed it because he was back at home telling his cousin about how she's a lunatic. Yeah, so the timeline doesn't exactly match Damn it, my money was on Liebman. So the second theory was that Bubbles was robbed and killed by a passing African. Okay, it's a troublesome terminology, but this is 1949 in South Africa. We weren't doing so well no, we <laughs> in human rights things at that time. Um, Linda said that she was robbed by a passerby. So buyer? she was robbed a by a passerby. Mm. And this hypothesis was supported by the fact that her mouth was stuffed with lime. Now, apparently, among certain African peoples, it is customary to place something in the mouth of a victim who has suffered a violent death to prevent him or her from speaking ill of the killer in the afterlife but they think that this theory is incredibly weak for example if the motive for the crime was wobbery wobbery yeah wobbery why was bubbles killed and then why was the body so neatly laid out it was supposed to be like a, a quick like you know yeah. score why would they take the time to now take her to this field and do all of that so the theory is is that that was done in order to throw off the investigation so somebody knew that mm. about certain traditions mm -hmm. and decided to put that in there that it would be easier to be like hey let's just nab the first random black person and blame them for it but thankfully they didn't fall for that <laughs> the third and possibly most plausible answer was advanced by the late benjamin bennett who was crime writer for the argus at the time and Bennett suggested that Bubbles probably tried to hitch a lift home and was picked up by a passing motorist. Hmm. If there had been two men in the car, the passenger would have moved into the back so that Bubbles could have, could have the front seat. The man in the back was in a perfect position to put a scarf around her neck to restrain her and she was accidentally asphyxiated. Afterwards, her body was carried into a nearby plantation and dumped. Lime was put into her mouth simply to confuse the police into thinking the crime had been perpetrated by an African. All this is merely conjecture, however, we are still left with the question of who killed Bubbles Schroeder. But yeah, thank you so much, Tom. That was really great. Yeah, you can really expect more of those. If you guys like it, give it a thumbs up so we know. And if you don't like it, you're going to get more of it anyway. <laughs> we don't care.
So give us a thumbs up if you don't want any more. <laughs> So, shall we do a little bit of exploring? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna go explore the old zoo. I don't even know if you can still see us. Hello. 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 You can hear us though, so yeah. it's fine. Yeah. So we're okay. gonna go explore the zoo. We're gonna show you guys what the zoo looked like. So guys, I have been Lady Fluffy Panda. This has been a Town Loves Cheer. And all our links will be in the description below. <laughs> So if you would like to give us a like, maybe subscribe, Yay! check us out. Our social media accounts will be down below outside of what fluff. Mm -hmm. So if you like what you see, if you like what you hear, make sure that you like and subscribe. Yes. So we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. used to be. Uh, I think they used to be water or new habitat, whatever. Yep. And I think this is where they used to, I don't know, sleep or something? Because I think these were bricked up. So this is the old zoo. Literally the only enclosures left are the crocodile ones and the lion's den. But apparently or there used to be a tan mall. So these are the stairs leading up from the crocodile enclosure. And then they just go all the way up to the lion's den. You'll be able to see better once we're inside, I think. Rent in Cape Town is ridiculous. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Tell you. View. Amazing. So mm. That's a plus. Mm. That's a plus. Really is amazing. Mm.